Hey, Perry, welcome to the show. As a way of getting started, give us a little background on yourself. Well, I am the guy who got fired from his engineering job, laid off actually, and <laughs> uh, went into sales. And, um, and I remember my friend Frank telling me, you know, Perry, you don't just stick a pencil behind your ear and start a whole new career. You know, there's a lot of, I was like, oh, you know, th those guys aren't really that smart, you know? And <laughs> well, then, you know, add in two years of bologna sandwiches and ramen soup and pounding the pavement <laughs> and trying to get into seat purchasing agents and engineering managers and, and, and manufacturers directories and, <clears throat> and, accomplishing nothing at trade shows and all of that kind of nonsense. Um, I got fired from that sales job about year two that I'll, I'll never forget. I walked in the door of my house after I got fired and my wife looks up and she goes, you got fired. <laughs> now, <laughs> how she knew that? Yeah. Well, and who knows how she knew that? Yeah. I mean, it was, it wasn't like, I, it was an outside sales job, so it wasn't inconceivable for me to stop by the house in the morning, but she knew. So, um, so 80-20 Sales and Marketing is the book that I wish that I'd had back then. And, well, boy, there's, there's a lot of nonsense that had to get pounded out of my head before I was ready to listen and a lot of pain that had to be applied to my my skull yeah. and, you know, various parts of my body. Um, so, um, you know, so, so what happened, the, the next job I got was actually a much better fit. And, um, and this was in 1997 and they had a website and they sold nationwide and engineers were already starting to use the internet fairly seriously in their jobs. And, without fully realizing it at the time, um, I was being welcomed into the world of online marketing. And, um, and four years later, we, we, we had grown that part of the company 2000% and sold it for $18 million to a public company. And I parachuted out with some stock options. And I said to myself, Hmm, I wonder what would happen if I actually got good at this. Yeah. Because I knew that, in the land of the blind, the man with one eye gets to be king. And I knew that selling industrial automation hardware was the land of the blind. Yeah. And I could certainly make a living there, you know, but again, what if I got really good? You know, I would say my, by my standards now, my skill set then was maybe a four or a five on a scale of one to 10. And I was in a market that was a three or a four on a scale of how much potential it really had. Yeah. Well, what happens if you're a seven skill set in a seven level opportunity? Or what happens if you're a nine skill set in a nine level opportunity? And um, so here we are cool. and I'm talking to you. Yeah. Now, I, I love your stuff. It's very much aligned with my view. Uh, our back backgrounds are very similar. I came out of software engineering. Yeah. And, and went into sales because I saw how much money they were making. Mm -hmm. And I was working, I was doing the 16 hours a day, uh, but I was making probably a quarter of what the sales reps were making. Yeah. And I'm like, and they would bring me on the calls because I was the, the guy who was presentable enough to give the demo and answer the questions. Mm -hmm. And I go, well, I can get the meeting and I can introduce myself. There can't be much more to it. But what <laughs> I love about your stuff is that, it is counterintuitive. I think, because I talk to sales leaders all day, pretty much every day, it's all about activity, KPIs, not accomplishment, not quality, and not adding judgment to what people are doing. Because that's what 80-20 forces you to do. It forces you to think, not just act. Well, if it makes you feel any better, <laughs> Pretty much everywhere in the world runs that way. Like science, for example, I've got a whole set of science projects and I can tell you that science is run on KPIs. Yes. How many papers did you publish? It doesn't really 
seemed to matter to an awful lot of people how much substance was actually the, like, did you actually discover anything? Like, is there anything new and profound here? Right. But so anyway, this is par for the course for the human race is people are just checking boxes. It's in every industry that you can possibly imagine. It's not just us. Okay. And and, you know, the, the, the key word that you said there was counterintuitive. And, and the fact is, is that anything that is effective, almost by definition, will be counterintuitive because what is effective is never what is average. Yes. Average is equals ineffective, yeah. right? Uh, if, if, if all the kids in class take a history test and the average is 77, then that means the average kid for all practical purposes is ineffective in history because they have no competitive advantage. And there's one kid in the class, one kid in the class is going to do more history in his life than the other 29 put together. That's a fact. And you're always looking at the outliers. So every, really everything in your life that really works um, in a big way is going to have a major counterintuitive element to it, even even though it may follow certain rules and certain models and certain best practices. Well, that's it. I mean, for, for me, and what pushed me towards it was I hate it wasting time. The, the idea of flying somewhere that you find out isn't qualified, they're not oh, motivated. Sure. There's no pain. There's no. They're just curious. So I was flying in to educate, <laughs> or. Um, you know, seeing somebody do better than me, who wasn't either working as hard as me or as smart as me, that would irritate me. Yes. Uh, maybe the middle Absolutely. child syndrome. So I've always found sales to be an intellectual exercise versus an activity exercise. And I think the activity yes. distracts us from what works. Well, Richard Koch um, quotes, I think it was actually Bill Bain, who I believe said this, that action drives out thought. Yes. Now, when I was in my 20s, um, it, the, same, the era where I had that sales job and, a, and I, was, I, I was in Amway and I, and I picked up this slogan from the MLM world, which was massive action solves every problem. No, 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 no. The de you know, okay, the definition of sanity is doing what you've always done, expecting different. No, you, you know what the like insanity squared is, is doing what didn't work before even harder. Yes. That's sales it, logic. That is, that is sales logic because I go in and if 50 calls a day doesn't work, you've got to do 100. And it's like, well, wait a second. But let's, let's drill down on who is most likely, who could be interested. And people, that thinking, that exercise irritates a lot of people because it requires thinking. Most and, people don't like to think. And if you asked, because I listen to podcasts all the time, oh, what's the one piece of advice? And the answer 80% of the time is hard work. And I'm like, oh, brother. That, what kind of advice like, is that? Well, first of all, does anybody not know that hard work is highly correlated with success? I think everybody knows that. But there's everyone at Walmart, McDonald's, uh, every warehouse, every minimum wage job, I bet they're working hard. I, I, I would probably love to see some studies, but I don't think hard work is highly correlated with success. I think hard work is moderately correlated with success. I mean, I do think that, um, you know, in certain, there's certain parts of a craft where it really requires a tremendous amount of perfection. You know, if you're going to be a world-class bass player, then you're going to spend your time in the woodshed. But even then, you know, the question is, well, are you, 
are you just going through the motions and spending time or are you actually moving that envelope of your skill level every time you sit down and play? Yes. Right. And, and if you're going to do that, well, nobody, nobody, you're, you're not just going to like put a bunch of sheet music in front of yourself or watch a bunch of YouTube videos and just mindlessly go through it. You're going to have to have to have a strategy and you're almost certainly going to need a music teacher or a coach uh, even Michael Jordan needs a coach, right? Yeah. So, um, so well, so the good news is, is not very many people think this way. Um, and, well, and that's good. So, <laughs> it reduces the amount of competition. 80-20 is like black belts. It's like there's first degree, second degree, third degree. And every, all the way to ninth, and every step, you're, you're doing yet another thing that is counterintuitive, yet another thing that is completely countercultural. Comfort zone. And, well, I mean, that's how people become billionaires. I, I've never met a, a billionaire that thinks in a conventional fashion. Now, so. I, I think the problem with it is people think it's enough to know of it versus applying oh, heavens. it. You, you, need to, you, you need to have 80-20 in your bones, in, in your in your muscle memory, but you also need an intellectual understanding of what it actually is. So the first time that I remember applying 8020 to a business situation, I, I, it was in the software company that got sold. Um, and I was reading in some book and it said 20% of your customers produce 80% of your sales and, and, and vice versa. And, and I thought, is that true? And I printed out a QuickBooks report and I got out my calculator and I went down from top to bottom and I was like, I'll be darned. When I got 20% of the way down, it was 80% of the money. And I, I had this kind of vague realization that there was this guy named Dimitri who would call me up every few months and basically waste my time. And he would only spend about three to $5,000 a year and he would bust my balls about features we didn't have and all this kind of stuff. And, <laughs> and I realized that I should probably just tell him to go buy from the competition and be done with the guy because time would be better spent with these yeah. other people. But that was so counter to my Protestant work ethic training right. that I never did that. Um, and, and so the meaning of 80-20, so then I just went on right and kind of ignored it but but the 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 when things kicked in was i read richard kosh's book the 80 20 principle which somebody urged me he's like you got to read this book and i read this book and and on page 14 he goes 80 20 has a lot to do with fractals and chaos and then he just goes on and i'm like wait a minute Fractals and chaos is when you have patterns within patterns within patterns within patterns. Like a tree has a branching pattern all the way from 100 feet down to a microscopic on a leaf. There's the branching, branching. And I was like, wait a minute. Is he actually suggesting? I think what that would mean is that there's an 80-20 inside the 80-20 and then another one and another one. And it, it, it could go on almost infinitely. And I was like, what is that? And I jumped up out of the coffee shop and I ran home and I, I, my, my business was a year and a half old. Okay. And when your business is a year and a half old, think about how much data you've accumulated, which is some, but not much. Yeah. Right. How many sales and the customers and the clients and all the stuff. And so I had a few clients and, and then I was also, I was sending out these audio CDs and I was driving traffic to my website. It was all very nascent and, and stuff. And, and I, 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 I had all these papers and reports and the calculator and I'm in the living room and I'm, and I'm just having this like orgasmic epiphany, like, Oh my goodness. Like I could literally predict like if I'd known 80, 20 a year ago, I could have predicted what was going to happen this year. I wouldn't have known where it was going to happen, but I would know what happened. I would know how big it's going to be and all this stuff. 
And I'm like, oh my word. And, and now what it also meant, it also meant that 80-20 was a law of nature. It wasn't just this thing that a certain group of business people or economics people happened to find handy. Okay. It is a, it is a universal law of cause and effect like gravity. It's okay. just more abstract than gravity. It's less obvious, but it's just as true. Um, and it's like everything. I mean, it, it, you know, the, it's, it's the birds on the Galapagos islands and it's craters on the moon. And it's, it's, it's return customer returns for defective products. It's all 80, 20. And so, my mind was just on fire and, and you know, there's just, there's not many times in your life when something way out at the edges of your awareness suddenly becomes the center of the universe and everything around you has to reorient your, itself. But that's exactly what happened. And so it was like, wow, if you understand, if you really understand 80, 20, then you, you have this easy way to explain almost anything that works in business strategy, almost anything that works in marketing or even, even copywriting or Google advertising or yeah. any of that stuff. And, and I was um, very shortly after that, I started writing my Google ads book and I, I understood like what clicked in place was Perry. Really all you do in a Google account is you just start applying 80, 20 and then applying it again and applying it again. And you take every different column and you sort, you sort from top to bottom. And then you ask, so what 80, 20 operation do I need to do on this column, which means I need to change this over here. And then I sort by the next one and I can optimize. I can get, I can get to 90 or 95% optimization only touching 25% of the system. Yep. And, 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 well, that's what business is. Entrepreneurs raise things from areas of low value to the areas of high value. And the way they do it is by applying 80-20. And, like, even if you've never heard of 80-20 before in, in your entire life, and even if you're making $400,000 a year and you've been selling for 30 years, you've been applying 80-20. Whether you know it or not. Whether you know it or not. But once you know it. Yeah. See, see, for me, uh, it, it really hit home. Uh, my company got acquired by this Fortune 20 company, and I was at this kickoff meeting, and they were talking about their business. There's a $130 billion business, and they got, um, you know, 20% of their revenue from eight clients. Yes. <laughs> and yes. you're like, no, 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 no. It's got to be spread out more than that. And they're like, right. No. <laughs> right. So they had, you know, these small account teams on these huge, enormous accounts, and then everybody else. And, wow. Yeah. And when you think about how people spend their time, because you apply it to time, which is the critical, because that's our only real resource that we have, mm -hmm. our time and what we do with it. Yeah. You know, and what do people do? They look at the eight or 10 hours as equal. <laughs> not, not so equal, is it? Further from the truth. 1% of your time is 50% of your value, right? If, you, if you're on straight commission, half the money you made last year, you made in three to five days. And that, that really becomes recursive. Now, the, the issue that I try and get with sales leaders is that competence in a company grows linearly, but incompetence grows exponentially. <laughs> That's true. So what, what um, happens? Does every company, oh, we want to double our revenue next year. So they just extrapolate the 2x, 2x marketing spend, 2x hiring, 2x enablement. And all of a sudden, it, it only gets you 20, 30% increase because incompetence is growing. Competence is just linearly moving up. And what this does, this you know, I, I try and focus them on prices law, which kind of gives it a, a different view because it's different. 80, 20 people, they think they just, because they know what it means, they think they know it and they're applying it. The applying part is what's missing. 
they, they look so, at it in the rearview mirror, not in the windshield. Well, so so eighty twenty means that sales and marketing is a disqualification process, not a convincing people process. It means that it's a needle and haystack exercise, and it's about the needles, not the haystack. So my my friend John Mendocha came up with this brilliant set of rules called the five power disqualifiers. And the five power disqualifiers, well, so here's the story. So John was a professional gambler for three and a half years in Vegas, and he was involved in organized crime and, 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 <laughs> and all kinds of crazy stuff. And one day he's sitting in a restaurant booth with a couple of guys and they're having an argument and they're like, yes, you will. No, I won't. Yes, you will. And out comes a Glock and the guy plants it on the other guy's head and he's like, yes, you will. And John's sitting across the table from these guys and John's like, dude, if you don't get out of here, it's going to be you one of these times. And he just, he just walked. Um, he was 21. And he got a job in Southern California selling um, electronic hardware. And his boss plunks 206 leads down on his desk. And he goes, John, go see all these guys and close some deals. Yep. All right. So John, John has worked as a professional gambler in various and sundry other tasks for, from age 17 to 21 in Las Vegas working with, shall we say, extraordinarily pragmatic people, okay? And John, John has acquired a fair amount of street smarts, and John knows there is no way 206 of these people are worth going to see. Or so he, comes, yeah. he, he comes up with these five questions, um, and these became the five power disqualifiers, and here's what they are. Number one, do they have the money? If they don't have the money, they're not buying the stuff. If they don't have the budget, they're not buying the stuff. Now, as rudimentary as that sounds, I held hands and sang kumbaya with wonderful people that didn't have the money. And I just thought. What do most reps think? If they talk to me, they're qualified. <laughs> so have the money. Number two, do they have a bleeding neck? Okay, so if you break your arm, you go to the emergency room and you think you've got an emergency. And then a lady gives you a clipboard and sits you down with some good housekeeping magazines. And an hour and a half later, you're still sitting there with your broken arm waiting for somebody to call your name, right? But then a guy with a gunshot wound with blood squirting out of his aorta <laughs> comes right. in. And, he, and they, they send them right in, right? Like their definition of emergency and your definition of emergency. Well, people spend money when they're having an emergency. So that's bleeding neck, okay? Number three, they have the ability to say yes and not merely the ability to say no. And once again, as common sense as that may seem, I don't know, I can't tell you how many you know, I go talk to some junior engineer and he likes me and I like him. And I spent an hour and a half with a guy and he's like, well, I'm going to need to go show this to my boss. And then I immediately know, well, he's not going to, he's going to talk to his boss about this for seven minutes and he's not going to understand what I spent an hour and a half training. And we have to start all over. Yeah. Right. Okay. So yeah. Billy is say yes. Number four, they buy into your unique selling proposition, like your way of doing stuff, not just a way of doing stuff, right? And then last, it fits their overall plans. Now, this is actually a very, very deep thing. And if you take the five power disqualifiers and you methodically apply them, first of all, it takes all the pressure out of the sale because your posture towards the customer is, hey, look, I'm not here to convince you of anything. Frankly, I got to ask you a bunch of questions before I even know if I'm going to stay here and talk to you. So, right. And it, it, it totally shifts the energy of the meeting. And th there's an online version of this too, which I use a lot. Um, and it's, it's a, 
it's like it's giving a quiz. So for example, we've got a quiz called is Facebook for me.com. We got a quiz called is AdWords is Google AdWords for me. And so like is FB for me.com, you go there and you answer a dozen questions and it gives you a scale from one to 10, like on a scale of one to 10, how good is Facebook advertising a fit for your business? Are you a 3.6? Are you a 6.9 or, or an 8.7? Well, a person doesn't have to play with that very long to make it very clear. We're not taking everybody and we're not trying to get everybody. We want seven, eights, and nines. We don't care about fours and fives, right? And that's a great lead generation tool. Like, should you be doing this or should you just hightail it out of here and go do something else? Because you know the Facebook reps is going to tell you to do it. Yeah. Of but I'm right, I'm not I'm not gonna tell you that. And it 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 earns trust. Um, and and so what you end up then is you only end up talking to at most 20% of the people and very often maybe only 5% and you actually only um, invest a significant amount of time with one or two or 3% and you have a high rate of sales. And there is a, there is a constructive virtue to a certain kind of laziness. Um, 80, 20 is about saying no more often than you say yes. And, you know, it's, it's really hard to switch into this mentality when you're already desperate, you know, and you're eating peanut butter and pimento cheese sandwiches for dinner. But it, you, you have to start adopting the mindset right away. I will not waste my time with people who are just going to waste my time. I would rather uh, sit on a park bench by the river than go talk to somebody who's never going to buy. Right, because people don't feel comfortable sitting down and strategizing with a, a, a notepad or an iPad or thinking through what makes those five things. They Who think it's lazy them? and they don't want their boss to see them doing it. No, because that's not work. Well, it's not, they don't right, think it's, it's not work. work. Their definition. But, you know, I spend every morning when I get up, I spend two hours in my notebook. Now, a whole bunch of that is really meditation, prayer, journaling, getting myself centered, and only some of it is strategizing. However, it doesn't, it, it frankly doesn't matter like what I tell you that it is. It is me getting myself right yeah. before I go out and face the world, okay? And I would say that when I am working, I am very effective. And I, I'm one of the most expensive, I'm one of the most expensive business consultants in the world. And people fly in from all over the world to come to my seminars. And, and I am, and this is actually true of the very best, most of the very best salespeople too. I am actually more of an artist than a business person and the art happens in concentrated doses at somewhat unpredictable times, okay? I am not a workhorse, I am not a machine. In the very best people in any profession, they are, are ditto. I don't care if we're, you're talking about like the best sales guy at IBM, or if we're talking the best professor at Harvard Medical School, or any high level people, they are all, in some sense, artists. They're not just guys who turn cranks. Right. Yeah. And, and I think, like, the, the word artist, of course, has all these, you know, um, starving artist and all these connotations. But I, I'm asking you to just contextualize it in a completely different way. Well, well it, it, where you come up with original ideas, where you are thinking and analyzing and reflecting on what is important and what is gonna work. Yes. I think today, uh, salespeople think just because of the automation that they're effective, they're busy. I call it doing dumb things faster. And well, that's, exact, that's exactly what it is. And now in 1998, man, you had an email and a CRM and 
and a website and stuff, man, you're like, man, you got a sledgehammer, man. Yeah, like, it, yeah it took you all the 30 things, minutes to like, find their phone number. And right. You couldn't figure but, out their email address. You'd be like, I don't even know who it is. Never mind their email address. <laughs> So if you were good for, if you were good with those tools 15 or 20 years ago, you were slaying oh, dragons, but, but it's not true anymore, right? It's, oh. there's a whole level of thinking and it's strategic and it's not mechanical. Um, and so, so yeah, 80, 80, 20 is an art form. Um, uh, one of my favorite sayings is art is science with more than seven variables. And what do you mean by that? Well, when, there's always a point of where the complexity is going to get anywhere, starting with, well, let's start with $3 pieces of pizza and work our way up from there. Like they're going to have a trillion gigabytes of data and not know what to do with it. Right. So you, you have to like, you have to take a step back and you have to make generalizations. Okay. And so, so here, here's an example of a brilliant generalization uh, is what is a star business. Um, a Boston Consulting Group came up with this maybe 50 years ago. Which companies are going to grow and make most of the profits? Wh which 20% of the companies are going to make 80% of the profits? It's, it's all the companies that are number one in a market that's growing 10% a year or more. Now, that is unbelievably reliably true. It is also a massive, brilliant, elegant simplification of a trillion pieces of data. Yeah. Like there's literally a trillion pieces of data involved in that, but you can distill it down to number one market growing 10%, which by the way, um, by the way, that tells you that tells you what, what company to go get a job at. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's people listening to us today and they're trying to get a job or they're thinking about a new one or whatever. Work for a company that's number one in its niche, growing 10% a year or more. If they're number four, don't work there. Yeah. Now, now you, have to, you have to be very you have to be very mindful of what you mean by niche. Okay. It, I mean, it, it, there's a ton of nuance to this. You, we could spend years on it, but like, is there, is, is the, like the, the diamond tip saw blade of that business is the diamond tip saw blade. Um, a like, okay, let's use cars for example. Let's use cars 10 or 12 years ago, for example. Um, everybody has a car, but only a few manufacturers have a car with an iPod station in it, okay? Well, you're not number one in the car market, but you're number one in cars with, with iPhone plugins. Yeah. Then you're, you're completely differentiated on this one point, and you're number one in in the market of people who want an iPhone station in, in their car. That's, that's what I need. And, and well, you, and you're going to have to understand the company's business in order to make that judgment. And you're going to have to ask them some very smart questions in order to understand that. Because if you're just looking at their website or you heard about it on monster.com or something, you're not going to know. And everybody's going to tell you, Oh, we're number one in this and number one in that. But if, but if you really find out, Right. Well, so now the guess what? Going to instead of with and, the and notice, yeah. notice what happens when you do that. You're disqualifying them. Yes, you're not yeah. trying to sell them. They're like, well, this, you know, we we had all these applicants and they uh, they asked us all these questions, or we asked them all these questions. But I had one guy that just pummeled us with questions. Yeah, right. Well, that's like a whole switch the game all different deal take, give control or take and control. if they if they don't like guys that ask questions you don't want to work there yeah cool hey this has been a great conversation um where would you like people to go to connect with you get your book and learn more about your work you can go to sell 8020.com and you can get 8020 sales and marketing for a penny plus shipping 
and that's seven bucks in the U.S. and fourteen outside of the U.S. Um, or you could go to Amazon and pay full price for it. But if you buy it on my website. Um, you will get some additional tools and videos and trainings that people who buy the book elsewhere don't get. And you'll also get to watch how I sell and how I work. Um, Sell8020.com. Um, and this, this book will change your life. I, I was having beers with a friend who's not from my business circles, um, but who is getting ready to get an MBA at Northwestern next year. And I said, Todd, this book is as valuable as a year of MBA school. And I looked at him right in the eye and he goes, you're serious. I said, I am heart attack serious. Yeah. This book is as valuable as a year of MBA school. Now you go, why would you sell a year of MBA school of value for $7? Well, buy it and find out <laughs> and see if I am telling you the truth. And if you decide that I am a flim flam man, then you can unsubscribe and you can banish me from your world. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think you're going to like it.